Some of you are Star Trek fans, perhaps. Um, what's the motto of Star Trek? It's to boldly go where no one has gone before, right? And everybody's pretty happy about that, you know? And it's a very, very basic archetypal story. But it does encapsulate the human relationship with reality. It's that's, we, can't, we, we think of reality that way. We think of the known and the unknown. And we think of there being a boundary between the known and the unknown. And we think about being on the edge of that boundary and looking over. And that's the, that's the archetype of exploratory behavior. Now, the, the serpent symbol is even deeper than that because the serpent symbol represents the world before it's even been categorized. It's like, what's there when there's no one there? That's what this symbol represents. It's the ultimate in the unknown. It's the source of all things. And so it's infinite and self-contained, and it's matter and spirit at the same time. And partly it's infinite because you never run out of an unknown things, and it's, um, it's eternal because you never run out of unknown things, and, and it's matter because when you interact with it, you, you conjure up the material world, so to speak, in all sorts of different ways. You know, sometimes by actually crafting material things, and other times by merely defining the material of the space that you're in. But you also extract information out of it to build yourself out of. Because you might say, well, where do you come from? Well, part of it is, there you are, you have a biological structure. But obviously, we think of nurture. You're extracting information from the environment all the time. Now, you might say, well, how do you do that? And I think there's... There's a variety of ways. One is, you know, Piaget would say, well, you mimic the world with your motor apparati. So, for example, when you look at the can, this is part of looking at the can. The can is a graspable object. That's the can. That's how you define it. So, this is like the can. And so that's a pattern insofar as it's stable in space across time. It's a pattern. And you can match that pattern. And so it's a transfer of the pattern here to a transfer to the, to the pattern here. And that's, that's the use of information. Information is information. It's, it's, there's something, there's lots of different definitions of information, by the way. But, but the information that we think of as information is that that you can gather, that you can then use. You incorporate it. And then it's in you, and then you can use it. So, insofar as you're constantly adjusting to the external world and its demands, you're, you're reproducing the pattern of the external world in your body. That's one form of representation. That's, a, that's an informed representation. And then you abstract out of that to make your abstract representations. But the point is, you're pulling the information out of it. So the unknown is the ultimate source of information. And it can be very, very dangerous. But it doesn't matter because it's less... The, the human supposition is that the unknown is there and it's dangerous, but the best thing you can do with it is confront it voluntarily when it makes itself manifest, when you're prepared. That's your best bet. And that's, that's, that's our archetype, fundamentally. That's our bet on reality. You know, evolutionary biologists say that we occupy the cognitive niche. If you read the terror management theorists, say, those guys think that you've got to have a psychological theory that's pretty coherent and integral in order to protect yourself against death anxiety. And e even though in the final analysis that theory is false, it's insufficient. It's there as a defense, like a Freudian defense. Okay, and if, if not that, then you have to conceptualize yourself as a hero because that boosts your ego, makes you feel good about yourself, and you can find temporary relief in the delusional fantasy that there's something special and heroic about you. Okay. That's a materialist interpretation of archetypal reality. And it's a powerful one. That was Ernest Becker. And Becker was a smart guy. And he took Freudian theory to its ultimate limit. He never read Jung, though. It was a big mistake. Jung has a different proposition. It's really, really different. His proposition is... If you extract out all the information that's available to you by paying attention to the disjunction between the territory and the map, so if you let, your, if you let what shines forth guide you and you explore it, then you'll extract out enough information from that process of exploration so that you can build yourself into something so strong that you're actually just no longer afraid of death. And there's nothing false about that. 
See, the Becker and the Freudians think that's impossible. They think, you know, basically, you're a, you're a sand sculpture in a hurricane. We don't know what people are. And we don't know how tough they can be. And people can be unbelievably tough. You know, I mean, think about people, for God's sake. It's like my sister-in-law works in palliative care. You know, that's kind of rough. Everybody she works with is going to like, they're going to die in three weeks. She does it. Is she deluded about it? You know, I, I don't think so. I talk to her. Like, she seems to be quite aware and also quite happy when her life is going well. You know, because she sees all the time what happens if it doesn't go well. It's like the whole damn bottom falls out. It's like, if, if you... I have a little joke that I always tell myself about this. It's like, how can you tell when you're having a good day? And the answer to that is, there isn't a crocodile attached to your leg. And that's about the right attitude. And, you know, if you're dealing with something like palliative care, that's basically how you think all the time. Oh, you had a rough day at school? Oh, huh, that's not so bad. At least there isn't a crocodile attached to your leg. You know, and I also think that that's what happens to adolescents in cultures where they undergo a really profound initiation. You know, they're taken out of their... It usually happens with the boys, and I think that's because Mother Nature blesses women with their own automatic initiation. Um, they take the boys out from their mothers. Often their mothers are all crying and unhappy about this, and some of that's ritual and some of it's true because they're going to lose their child. And they take the kids out, the boys out, and they, like, they just scare them to death. You know, they bury them, they put them, in a, they put them in a cave. I don't know if you've ever been in a cave with the lights off, but I can tell you. A cave is very dark, and you can imagine. Imagine sitting in a cave for two days. Okay, now, you might say, well, what's in that cave? And the answer to that is, who knows, right? Spiders, snakes, whatever, cave monsters, whatever. But I can tell you one thing that's in that cave, and that's your imagination. And believe me, you're going to confront that sucker with two days inside a cave. You're going to wonder, well, are they ever going to come back and get me? I'd be wondering that. It's like, what if the roof caves in? What if this is an evil trick? And then you think, well, what are, what are all the things that could be in that cave? Well, whatever is really in that cave is, is certainly not going to be any more horrible than the things that you might imagine could be in that cave. So, you know, in some sense, an initiation like that is a confrontation with the ultimate horrific limits of imagination. And my suspicion is, if you get through that, I mean, and there's more to the initiation ceremony than that because you also get inculcated with the tribe's customs and beliefs at the same time. You know, so you're stripped bare in some sense and then rebuilt as an adult. I think part of what that initiation does is show you the difference between things you should be worried about and things you shouldn't be worried about. And it isn't clear to me that you can have your nervous system calibrated properly until you've taken yourself right to the edge because then you know what's frightening and what isn't. And there's every reason to believe that we have no idea how courageous people can be. You know, they can be insanely, ridiculously courageous. And I, I think palliative care work is a good example of that. You know, caring for the dying, that's... You know, I think that people who work in funeral homes are like that. And they, they seem to manage it, you know. I mean, I've talked to people who work in funeral homes. I said, well, like, how the hell can you... Stand doing this, they say. Well, it really makes me appreciative of my life. You remember that little snitch thing that Harry Potter used to chase around when he was playing Quidditch? That's the unknown, by the way. That's actually a symbol of the unknown. It's called the winged chaos. And I, I had no idea how the hell J.K. Rowling knew about the winged chaos, or the round chaos is another way of, of describing. Because if you put round chaos into Google... The only thing you get is my website. Now, it's, it's something I took from Jung, but it's pretty damn obscure. But apparently she studied a lot of alchemy before she wrote Harry Potter. And that knowledge, consciously or not, made it into... She's pretty damn smart, so it's, and, but she's creative, you know? So if you're creative, there's always a dance between your consciousness and your unconscious mind, a creative dance. You, things emerge, and you play with them, but, and they emerge, and, then, and you play with them. Like, the writers I know... Their characters come alive for them, and they, and they just write down what the characters are likely to do, you know. And there's going to be some conscious direction, but it's this dance between unconsciousness and consciousness that really makes up creativity. 
But anyways, you know, in the Harry Potter Quidditch game, what happens when Harry gets the little ball? Right, right, right. So there's really two games going on at the same time, right? There's the game everyone else is playing, and then there's the game that the seeker is playing. And when the seeker wins, everyone wins. That's the rule in Quidditch. And that's the rule. When the seeker wins, everyone wins. 